Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Friday. Friday. Happy Friday. Friday, May 12, 2023. It's about 1.30 in the afternoon here on the East Coast of the United States. Phil Giraldi uh, joins us. Phil, uh, always a pleasure. Phil, this is your second time this week. You can come on every day if you want. It's such a joy <laughs> to be able to pick your brain about the, the arcane ways uh, of the intelligence community. Uh, you had a piece uh, at the UNS Review and uh, reprinted at lewrockwell.com uh, with the very, very intriguing title of The Difference Between Secrets and Lies. Now, I suppose that the intelligence community has a category of secrets it feels it has to protect in order to save the lives of individuals that gave them those secrets. But can they lie about it? Well, that's, that's of course, the tricky part. The, uh, I'm sure you've heard of the expression that uh, the intelligence agencies have to uh, protect their sources and methods. Oh, I've now, heard that until I'm, I'm blue in the face. Yeah, well, that's a secret. And um, in, yeah. in my career with the agency, uh, I ran many agents who were betraying, in effect, their own countries to provide information to the United States. Now, those people's identities had to be protected uh, if we were going to get the information and if they were going to survive. Uh, I knew of at least five agents during my time that I knew personally uh, that there were uh, revelations of their relationship with the U.S. They were arrested by their own governments and they were executed after being tortured. So this is serious stuff. And that's what I call a secret. That is something where it's in your interest and it's in someone else's interest uh, to protect information. That's a secret. And it's good that the government is conscious of that and does it on occasion. So now, when asked under oath about information that is a secret, the truthful and, and transparent answer to which would result in the torture and death of an innocent or of another person, never mind their innocence, torture is always wrong. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, how does one answer? Does one lie or does one just decline to answer? I, I think the, the right answer is you decline to answer. Uh, or Unless the, uh, the, the questioning uh, uh, mechanism is such uh, that the, that kind of information could be very carefully protected. M meaning uh, the, the Q&A occurred in some secure secret federal facility as opposed to uh, uh, an open public hearing on Capitol Hill. Yeah, exactly. So when uh, James Clapper, then uh, the director of national intelligence, uh, was famously uh, asked by Senator Ron Wyden, uh, director, does the federal government spy on tens, excuse me, on hundreds of millions of Americans and he said, no, he lied. Was that a lie to protect a secret or could there have been a uh, non uh, perjurious way to have answered that question? Well, I think it's an out and out lie. Uh, that comment in fact is famous as being an out and out lie. Right. And, uh, and the, the, the reality of course is he was lying to protect a policy that was in place by the government that in itself was illegal. So that's a double lie. Right. Uh, that's where I'm, I'm seeing the distinction between there are some things that are secret that have to be protected for various reasons. And I think it's pretty clear if you explain to the average American what that distinction might be, they'll understand it. What, what are um, intelligence agents taught? What are the rules given to them uh, about secrets and lies? How do they decide what secrets are worth lying about? Well, actually, the average intelligence uh, officer like myself, mid-level type officer, actually working in the in the field, in the intelligence business, uh, we are told never to reveal to anyone information that is classified. And that's basically the way most people, uh, CIA and other intelligence agencies in the U.S. government, operate when they're overseas or even in the U.S., it's, it's a hard and fast rule. 
you do not reveal classified information. So I guess Clapper should have said, Senator, I'm, I'm unable to answer that question in a public forum. Yeah, he could have said that if, he, if he'd been a little more uh, uh, less a politician. Now, bear in mind that all these guys that are at the top level in all these agencies, all these uh, uh, letter agencies are basically politicians uh, and very few of them have actually worked as intelligence officers in the field or, as, uh, you know, they, this is something that in a lot of ways they're not even really familiar with. All right, let, let me let me ask you then about individuals. George Tenet, Jack Brennan. I, mean, I know you have some very strong words about him, words with which I, when we get to them, and I know the audience uh, will agree. Uh, William Burns, uh, Mike Pompeo, uh, uh, Leon Panetta. I'm just rattling off from memory the names of recent directors of the CIA. Were they ever in the field? gathering inf secret information from foreign sources, the identity of which could not be revealed? Or did they come from Congress or business or some other place and just put in charge of this massive spying operation? Uh, well, uh, the, the reality is that uh, almost none of them have had any experience working as an actual intelligence officer. And George Tenet, for example, was, uh, was a, a congressional staffer and made the jump over to the um, to the agency and became its director. Uh, th this is uh, absurd, but that's the way the system works. It rewards political loyalty more than it re than it rewards uh, expertise. What did you mean when you wrote the administration of George W. Bush elevated lying to a level to to a level hitherto hardly imagined? in Washington. All right. Uh, I probably should have said <laughs> that the Pentagon Papers were an indication that there was something before George okay, W. Okay. Okay. All right. But, but George W. Bush, I'm citing because he's uh, within our living memory of what took place. It was a war against a country that in no way threatened the United States uh, that was stitched together by a series of lies that were put together by the administration very consciously in terms of knowing what exactly what it was doing. And it was all designed to, to trigger a war. That war wound up killing 400,000 Iraqis, uh, you know, and we still have troops there. This is, uh, this is the kind of thing that's going on now in Ukraine. Same sort of thing. Where's right, the threat you... from Ukraine? Right, right. But uh, be before we leave Bush, Donald Rumsfeld, Paul Wolfowitz, Doug Feith, Scooter Libby, I guess we could put in there uh, Dick Cheney and George W. Uh, himself, um, did not hesitate to foster lies to the American public and perpetrate a fraudulent war. You know that personally, don't you? Yeah, I was I was still in the agency at the time when all this was going on. I was uh, sitting there with some of my former CIA classmates who were analysts who were covering all these issues and saw all the raw intelligence. And these people were telling me this is nonsense. And then I'm Me hearing meaning the idea that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction is nonsense because we have the raw intelligence here and it's telling us he doesn't have it. Right. That's exactly right. And and everyone inside the system at a certain level uh, knew that this was all fraudulent. And did, yet you're seeing did George, George Bush. W. Bush himself know that the mantra Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction was fraudulent? That I don't know. I mean, I do know that this certainly went up through the pipeline, at least to the vice president's office. That was Dick Cheney. And it went through the uh, system in the uh, Pentagon. The Pentagon set up a separate office, Office of Special Plans, uh, headed by Doug Fife, which basically existed to funnel information into the system. In in information that may very well have been fraudulent because that's what their bosses in the West Wing of the White House wanted to hear. Yes. Okay. With that as a background, you say the following. George W. Bush's subterfuge, I'm adding the word subterfuge, was child's play 
compared to the contemporary environment where the media has joined with Joe Biden to lie about nearly everything, your phrase, Phil, God bless your courage, involving Ukraine, to lie about nearly everything involving Ukraine. Explain. Okay, my explanation as to why it's worse now is because the media is fully on board. The media uh, does the work that the George W. Bush team would have done in terms of debunking uh, criticism. Uh, the media does all the running for them. Uh, as soon as um, someone like Cy Hirsch comes out with a devastating story about a war crime, uh, it's the media that turns on them and comes up with a fake story to uh, disprove that or or to diminish what he's suggesting. How, how did the government succeed in co-opting the media? I'm, I'm thinking in my mind when I was a teenager, the Vietnam War. Oh, the media must have caused LBJ sleepless nights, night after night after night after night. And now we know why, once the Pentagon Papers uh, were revealed thanks to uh, Daniel uh, Ellsberg. Mm -hmm. But now the media is almost literally in bed with the Biden administration. We're going to talk about Teixeira anymore. People will say, who? It's not even on the front pages. It's not even on the back pages anymore. This kid revealed some of the most, if he's the revealer. He is, a, I'll say it precisely, this kid, he's 21 years old, is accused of revealing documents the accuracy and the authenticity of which the government hasn't challenged and the essence of which shows that the government knows Ukraine is losing, knows Ukraine's um, air defenses have been degraded nearly down to zero and lies about it to the American public. And his name appears nowhere because the media is in bed with Bi the Biden administration. How did that happen? Well, that's the perfect example of what goes on here. I mean, as, as we've discovered, we've discussed in previous uh, uh, days, uh, the, uh, the, the fact that this guy has kind of disappeared and his story has disappeared. His motives have never surfaced. This, this is all incredible. This is a cover up of enormous proportions. And it's basically being done to keep the administration from being embarrassed about this whole thing. Because, you know, the American public is starting to wake up to the fact that they're being lied to all the time. It started with COVID and it's continued with Ukraine. Cy Hirsch um, revealed, as you say, a war crime. Cy Hirsch revealed an American military attack on the civilian property of an ally the pipe stream. The ally never complained. The country in uh, commercial cooperation with the ally, the ally is Germany, the country in commercial cooperation with them is Russia, said, well, we told you all along uh, the U.S. Uh, did it. Why the silence in the media? Well, that's again, that's, the well, it, the, there's a mystery there which is why this has become so extreme, this reflex on the part of the mainstream media to cover up for government lies and for government crimes. This is quite incredible. But I would argue that a lot of this has been an evolutionary process over the last 20 years, whereby the media and the government uh, have been working together cooperatively because they both need, e need each other. The, the media needs to have leaks from the government to have, tell its stories, and, and the government needs the media to provide cover. So I think that's a simple explanation of how it's proceeded to get to this point where there is no critique of the government and there's no critique of the media. Has uh, President Zelensky, to your knowledge, ever denied the Cy Hirsch report that the Zelensky is the head of a criminal uh, organization, a criminal gang, that has quite literally siphoned 400 million with an M dollars uh, from the uh, financial aid that the US has given to Ukraine. And that Bill Burns, the head of the CIA has shown uh, uh, President Zelensky a list of the siphoners and his name was at the top of the list. Has Zelensky ever acknowledged or denied this? As far as I know, 
personally, no, he hasn't. Uh, this has been kind of uh, something that uh, at least some of us know about, have heard about. And, and the Burns visit, I think, has been verified that the visit took place, uh, although nobody is becoming completely clean as to what uh, Burns said to Zelensky. It appears, apparently, it was a warning that uh, we're aware of his theft and he can't continue to do it because it would be real hard to continue U.S. support for the war. So this, this it, is it's not kind of theft. Thing. This is not theft from his own government, although maybe that is happening. I don't know. This is theft from the American taxpayer because the proposal by Senator Rand Paul in the Senate and Congressman Thomas Massey in the House, two libertarians from Kentucky, uh, to have an inspector general examine or hand out the cash rather than just wire it into uh, Ukrainian uh, bank funds. Those uh, two proposals were never even allowed to come to the floor of the House or the Senate for a vote. Yeah, that's correct. And also uh, uh, Congressman Gates has uh, submitted a similar bit of legislation, which is going nowhere. Um, uh, you know, the, yeah, the, the money is being stolen from the United States. It was, there was a slate of hand in terms of oil purchases to do this. But it, it essentially, this money comes straight out of the U.S. taxpayer's pocket, uh, $400 million. I think that um, President Zelensky might be honest, however, in this clip we're going to show you from the BBC where he's basically saying we're ready to fight, but we don't have the uh, equipment with which to do it. Take a listen. Are you ready for this counteroffensive? Mentally, we're ready. In terms of how motivated our military are, we're ready. In terms of enough personnel in our brigades, we're ready. In terms of equipment, not everything has arrived yet. That's my answer. Uh, so you're still waiting for weapons and for the kind of military equipment that have been promised to arrive? Yes, we're still expecting some things. They will reinforce our counteroffensive. And most importantly, they will protect our people. We're expecting armored vehicles. They arrive in batches. We can advance with what we've got, and I think we can be successful. But we will lose a lot of people. I think that is unacceptable. We need to wait. We need a bit more time. So the spring offensive is not going to come in the spring, if at all. And it's not the Ukraine fault, Ukraine's fault. It's America's fault for not getting equipment there fast enough. That's the way I read that, Phil. Well, I think uh, Zelensky is playing a complicated game on a couple of levels. Uh, he's obviously eager to keep the flow of money, equipment. I mean, it, we talk about equipment and everything like that. And he talks about equipment. But quite a lot of money is being funneled in directly to support his, his government. So that that is coming from not only the U.S., coming from Europeans. So he's he's eager to keep this going, and I guess he's um, he's hoping that uh, somehow this will will turn a bit for him. Uh, he knows deep down, as does the Pentagon, that uh, he's losing the war. That the Russians have a, a manpower advantage of three to one. It's hardly uh, likely that he's going to turn it around. But this is just something he's like playing a card game here and, and keeping a, and an extortion act to a certain extent to keep the flow coming. And the flow, I guess, will just keep coming. I mean, the White House announced earlier this week one point two billion, but it's in the form of a credit, meaning the, the United States Treasury will pay the American manufacturers directly and they will ship the equipment over to Ukraine. Now, what happens when it gets there is up to the Ukrainians, but they can't really sell a tank. They need to use uh, the tank. So this is not cash uh, that they can easily steal. Um, do you think that the neocons really still believe that they can use this war, which started out as a border dispute and now is viewed as existential by President Putin because of all the military gear we in the West have aimed at Moscow? Do you think that the neocons in the State Department and, and the intelligence community and elsewhere in the American government still think they can use this war to drive President Putin from office? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know how to what extent they actually believe that. I think it's, uh, 
It's something they see as a correct policy. Uh, when I see, you know, statements from leading neocons, it's usually things of the to the effect of, well, you know, um, we have to weaken Russia. I mean, that seems to be the mantra. Weaken Russia, weaken Russia, because otherwise Russia will recreate the Soviet Union. Otherwise, Russia will become a threat to the United States. But this is all nonsense. And anyone who knows anything about Russia or its economy uh, or its uh, how it sees itself knows that this is nonsense. I want to uh, play a clip for you from our friend and colleague Scott Horton of antiwar.com when I asked him the other day uh, what he thought if there's a plan A or a plan B that these uh, creeps that brought us in the war actually have in their own minds or have uh, talked about. Take a listen. They clearly think that they're getting the better end of this, that they're bogging Russia down and bleeding them to bankruptcy. But of course, we're spending north of $100 billion on this effort ourselves. But they've said all along that what they want to do is just keep the war going as long as possible. And in fact, if you go back to the beginning of the war, everybody assumed, even the Ukrainian military assumed, the American spies and everyone else assumed that the Russians were going to roll right over their army and that we were going to be backing an Afghan style insurgency all along. That was plan A. So plan B was, oh, great. The military is able to continue to stand and fend the Russians off for all this time. We'll continue to pour all the weapons we can into them to keep that going as long as possible. But then that raises the real question is if and when the Russians are able to essentially completely smash and rout the Ukrainian military, it's still a land the size of Texas. And wow. I don't think they want to take the western half of it. But then if they don't, that leaves a rump Ukrainian state led by right wing nationalists allied with NATO and armed to the teeth that I presume that that is NATO's plan, that even if, let's say, the Ukrainian army falls apart tomorrow, they'll go back to plan A and try to keep this thing going until Putin has to resign in disgrace. What do you think, Phil? I think he's got his finger onto something. Yeah, I think that's very good analysis. That's uh, that's better than uh, a lot of what I've been seeing. Um, I, I think Scott has uh, has kind of nailed it. They have a uh, they have this sort of um, fantasy that somehow if you keep chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, you wind up at a point that's uh, advantageous for you. But of course, it uh, doesn't necessarily work that way. Bill Giraldi, always a, a pleasure, my dear friend. Have a, a great weekend. The weather's supposed to be beautiful here in the in the Northeast. We'll talk to you again next week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Boy, if you like that, like, tell a friend, and if you haven't, subscribe. Thank you for watching Judge Napolitano. Where's we get it? Judge Napolitano for judging freedom.